Hello everyone. Welcome uh, to the webinar on digital payment 2.0 in India, the evolving landscape. I'm your host, Shrikant Pale, and the head marketing at Acolyte Digital. The digital payment landscape, not only in India, but globally too, is evolving at an unprecedented speed with the rapid adoption by users across segments. Advances in technology, the regulatory canvas, and applied innovation brought in largely by fintechs are factors accelerating the growth. As the region seamlessly adopts technology, the adoption rate is set to multiply manifold in the coming years, and we are just at the beginning. In this webinar, we'll be exploring what digital payments will look like, the transforming landscape, and the role of technology to unlock true value of payments in the future. I'm joined by two eminent speakers, Arun Ram Prasad, who's the product strategist and head of UPI product at JustPay, and Anand Chandra, who's the growth leader for the BFS business unit for Europe and APAC at Acla Digital. Now, before I pass it on to Arun, a few housekeeping pointers. All of you are in listen-only mode, and if you have any questions, please do post it in the question section, and we'll address it at the end of the session. Without much ado, over to you, Arun. Hey, thanks, Anand. Thanks, Srikant, for this introduction. Um, uh, yeah, let me go to the next slide. So, payments 2.0. Um, so, traditionally, India has been uh, following the West and uh, innovating in innovation with respect to adopting business models, with respect to in adopting technology. We have always been following the West. But interestingly, in fintech and in payments, right, India has been a forerunner. India has been a pioneer in uh, fintech innovation, payments innovation, and, the, and exporting this kind of technology to the rest of the world. We can, uh, India is consulting, especially NPCI and RBI. Right? We are working with a lot of other countries to, to export, to, to consult them with respect to like how they can adopt digital payments that happened in India. Moving on. In the last six years, if you can, if you see, right, payments have grown 10x, especially retail payments, from 7 billion transaction to 72 billion transaction. And there has been a lot of initiatives taken by the regulator and the organizations like NPCI that pushed this innovation. So what are the such, such initiatives, right? Initiatives including financial inclusion, initiating towards digital first approaches, like launching Rupee card network, which is an indigenous card network developed in, in India, launching payments banks and small finance banks to take, to take banking to the remotest of the regions possible, launching UPI, which, which in fact marked the landmark moment in India's fintech journey, right? Um, and then BBPS. Such initiatives propelled in India's digital transformation from uh, 7 billion digital payments in 2016 to 72 billion digital payments in 2022. And if you see, interestingly, 46.6 billion transactions are contributed by real-time transactions, which is especially UPI, which is 3x more than China, 27x more than uh, United States, and this contributes to 40% of the world's real-time transactions. So what led to this phenomenal uh, growth in UPI? So if you see UPI, UPI traditionally, security and experience have always been a dual which means two sides of one coin you cannot have one without compromising on the other so what upi did was seamlessly struck a balance between security and experience first thing what upi did was it opened up the experience layers to consumer tech companies while retaining the infrastructure layer in banks realms so what these consumer tech companies came, they came and innovate on the user experience. The companies like Google Pay, companies like Phone Pay, companies like Paytm, Amazon Pay, all of them came and innovated on the customer experience part and brought in customers. While the banking layer remained secure without compromising on the two-factor authentication. So what they did, alternate, so India has always been a proponent of two-factor authentication and uh, RBI has been very strict about that. So what can be a seamless two-factor authentication in UPI? 
So one we all know, we all type in the UPA pin, which is something that we all know. So usually authentication is something based on something that you have, something that you know, something that you are. So UPI leveraged something that you have and something that you know as two factors of authentication. Something that you have is your mobile phone. As seamlessly verifying that you are using your same device for making a transaction makes the first factor of authentication in UPI. And keying in the four digit UPI pin, which we have always, always traditionally been doing in ATM systems and other places, right? This seamlessly solved for your experience layer uh, need not wait for an OTP to come. We not have uh, sometimes we will not have reliable network uh, connectivity and OTP gets relayed. Type keying in a six-digit six OTP. All these things have been a traditional problem, and UPS seamlessly solved for this thing. Second, it's a very simple feature, but most powerful feature of UPI I would say is trust. So when you are making a payment to someone, you always know who you are paying to. That address resolution. It's a very key feature, a powerful feature of UPI. We have all been using money transactions, money transfers through NEFT, RTGS, and other mechanisms. But when you, I, ha, I always have this fear. When I type in the account number, I feel that okay, what if I make a mistake here? Money will go to somebody else. So we are, I think all, almost all of us would have done it. We initially transact one rupee and then get a confirmation from the other party and then do the rest of the transaction. What UPI seamlessly did was address the resolution which is it gives you a vpa an alias to what you are uh, it's kind of an email id an alias to your account number and whenever the vpa resolution happens you get to know who you are transacting money to that's one of the most powerful features and the and that build the trust in consum consumers to adopt upi third is low cost acceptance so upi all we know that it has zero mdr which means merchant need not pay any uh, so usually mdr is something that uh, if you are paying a merchant uh, merchant if you're paying 100 rupees to a merchant merchant gets actually 98 rupees and two rupees goes into uh, two rupees or one rupee goes into uh, the entire ecosystem that powered this transaction in upi so merchant has to shell out two rupees or 1.5 rupees for this transaction in case of upi it's zero so merchant need not incur any additional cost he need not have any additional PO point of sale machines to accept payments, he just need to have a QR code stuck on his board somewhere. That's very cheap for a merchant to accept payments and it's all for the demand side, pushing people on the supply side to make UPI transaction, which is merchants because of the lack of uh, handling, cash handling is really expensive for all these merchants and they pushing the consumers, okay, you pay me through UPI. So these three, Key initiatives led to the growth of UPI in India. Moving on. So what is the vision for the next five years, right? So RBI has this vision. So whatever happened so far, RBI wants to take this to the entire India. They want to take this digital payments to everyone in India, to everywhere and every time. So that's the vision of RBI. In that regard, there has been a lot of initiatives that has been launched recently. And that's, that's that are in pipeline to be launched. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we will discuss that in the next one. So UPI one two three. So we are, so UPI when it was conceived initially, it's a smartphone based uh, mobile first kind of an approach. So the problem with that is that so you you need a smartphone, an app, and you need good network connectivity to make a UPI transaction or any transaction for that matter. But in India, there is close to 6 lakh villages still doesn't have any good network connectivity or no network connectivity. And how can we take digital payments to these interlands of India? A new feature, which is UPI 123, it's a feature phone based functionality where you, it's an IVR feature phone based functionality where you can just call a number and then you will have an options of like say you can uh, register yourself for upi through this feature phone functionality set your upi pin and you can make bill payments like electricity bill payments gas payments it will be automated so there will be bbps integration in the background which will go fetch your uh, bill number and, uh, based on your phone number it will get your bill and then you can make a payment 
to your electricity payments, bill, uh, gas payments. You can make payments to merchants. You can send transfer money to your friends and others. So it's a very powerful functionality to take UPI to the hinterlands of India. E-Rupee, which is an alternative to paper-based tra transactions. Uh, technically, it's a digital currency. It's a digital voucher. If anyone wants to like issue uh, money to somebody for a specific purpose, they can issue a digital voucher uh, through which uh, works underlying on the UPA protocol and especially UPA auto pay and UPA one time mandate uh, function, leveraging those functionalities. What it does is, let's say government wants to do direct benefits uh, trans transfers to people. They can create digital vouchers share this vouchers with the customers either as a qr or an sms code it has a token embedded in that code and there will be specific acceptance networks talking of e-rupee uh, when uh, this is a very powerful functionality it's equal to a digital currency it's a program on money that is an interesting concept where you can define who i want to give this money to and for what period it should be active and what purpose he should use this money for these are some of the uh, characteristics of e-rupee when this can be used for government direct benefit transfers used for csr kind of initiatives and uh, this will eventually link way into the central bank digital currency again it's a program on money you can uh, it's a digital currency with some kind of additional functionalities like distributed ledgers and others but e-rupee will lay the foundation for central banking digital currency that's in my personal uh, understanding Another key functionality that is coming up, which is credit on UPI, which is, which is more, one of the most awaited functionalities in UPI. Uh, when the initial protocol was designed, it had flavors to adopt credit cards on UPI. Currently, in UPI, as consumers, we will be able to only link our savings account uh, to UPI and make a transaction on UPI. As a result, what is happening, people are uh, using it for P2P transactions when uh, you want to send money to your friends. Transactions are seamlessly happening till one lakh rupees. But when it comes to merchant payments, people are very cautious. We on, we only make uh, a small ticket transaction through UPI, and high ticket transactions are always through credit cards to uh, leverage the credit availability for 45 days and so right. So what's happening is opening up of credit card on UPI is one of the disruptive moves where it is going to propel both UPI and cards acceptance. So right now you cannot use a credit card on a small store because it needs an additional POS point of sale machine uh, to be adopted by the uh, vendor of the merchant. While UPI had always made inroads into all small merchants with a, just a QR based acceptance. Providing credit through a QR based acceptance with minimal stress on the acceptance layer, there cannot, the acquirer need not issue POS machines and the merchant need not buy a POS machine. Also, this helps the issuer of the credit card. He cannot, he need not uh, give a plastic card anymore and manage this card uh, through a card life cycle as well. You can, this can be a virtual card which can be seamlessly linked to UPI and customers can make payment using credit anywhere and everywhere in India. Obviously, the acceptance layer will have some restrictions. Some merchants can prefer to have, okay, I will accept credit or I will not accept credit. That will be embedded as part of the QR itself. But this is going to be a great push to credit cards and credit to the entire ecosystem credit acceptance or credit penetration in india has still been minuscule and this is going to propel that uh, credit penetration in india moving on upi light so sorry can you go back to the previous presentation sorry payments for e payments for everywhere one of the key functionalities is uh, we are looking forward to is upi light upi light so why, why do we want UPI light? So we talked about how UPI struck a right balance between experience and security. But what is happening is, since we are using UPI for a uh, small ticket transaction, especially when you are paying a Chaiwala, when you are paying a small uh, Kirana, Kirana store, or when you are paying an ice cream parlor, you are surrounded by people. And when you are making a transaction, your UPI pin, you are going to type in your UPI pin, and which is getting exposed. So UPI light is one of the functionalities it's kind of a micro wallet in your phone itself where you can make small ticket transactions without the need of a upi pin without compromising on the two-factor authentication 
so there has been an all so it works basis an alternative authentication mechanism uh, leveraging your hardware secure module in the phone for upi like kind of an authentication this will lead way into upi offline where this micro wallet can be used to make offline payments where the acceptance net network or if when your phone is not uh, having the internet coverage but still the acceptance net network having an internet coverage can accept your payment uh, because the balance is maintained the wallet balance is maintained in your device all right so while arun comes back online i just wanted to also bring out an aspect from an emerging tech uh, lenses so arun touched upon different schematics schematics of how digital payments 2.0 is uh, changing and how we as an it services organization that specializes in emerging tech look at that canvas that changing canvas and if if you look at the, the six aspects which arun come to it uh, as soon as he uh, scales back in is you have scalability reliability affordability experience uh, in terms of agility so if you have to split those six vectors into two fragmented vectors you have an horizontal layer that is the next generation way of how arun described uh, through the lenses of just pay in terms of contactless payment digital wallets biometric authentication in your banking transactions your virtual cards uh, which basically allows you far more secure interaction into how you would engage with your um, uh, merchants and from there below in your retail segment uh, there is a lot of work that is being done uh, not just in india but across the different uh, regional aspect clearly led by asia is on facial recognition payment systems there are aspects of ai that were hooked uh, to largely just identification of who you are and what you do from a kyc perspective but associating a transaction to it is something that's what uh, payments 2.0 is, is is venturing towards uh, to that effect biometric payment cards are there you already have a contactless mechanism of how you would read certain transactions to a particular limit but biometric payment cards would allow you to do a lot more KYC driven transactions including your mortgage your credit loan your line of credit and several other aspects and then there is this one common cutting aspect from a horizontal perspective is fraud detection and monitoring if those are one of the thematics from a vector perspective then there are horizontals that is largely enablement from a tech tech viewpoint so while arun was uh, speaking and when he got disconnected he was just touching upon the voice assistance aspect of it the iot of things is how one interconnected systems is interacting and you, there are voice enabled payments that not just as the verification of it the validation of it but it also moves the transaction from point a to point b and from there on uh, it moves from the ecosystem from producer consumer to the provider right cloud engineering as we see is is largely what was driven from a regulation perspective is very stable people have a hybrid cloud multi cloud setup uh, we conducted a webinar that focused largely on the cloud engineering aspect of it now how do you draw scalability how do you draw reliability and that is where the compute capability of the true feature of cloud would come in and from a cloud compute uh, aspect if you look at what the slide describes is the propensity of the two vectors interchanging and exchanging with each other so there is a high degree of compute capability that you would draw as part of your transactions enriching from your digital wallets there is a high degree of validation verification that needs to happen both from a compute pre transaction and post transaction from a fraud detection monitoring right if you look at the third layer cyber security i don't think to anybody's surprise everybody agrees to the fact that the propensity that we have drawn across the two vectors cyber security is pretty high across all the transaction needs to be secure reliable it needs to have an audit you also need to have a very clean rollback mechanism and the rollback mechanism cannot be a, a dirty rollback mechanism in terms of entire transaction rolls back there has to be a capability where there is a point in time pseudo commit and that's where you look at only the last part of the transaction that failed would need to be monitored why it happened and how it happened 
cyber security is also around a lot of regulation across data exchange and data ops that needs to done uh, from a governing body perspective rbi as an organization has laid out a lot of uh, uh, transactional aspect that needs to be looked at you also have uh, the element of uh, cross-border payments you also have an element of how would you look at transaction into some of the countries that are not so necessarily open to the idea of open finance or what we would like to call it decentralized finance but from a global perspective so how does cyber security plays into that some of our engagements are more features toward uh, virtual card payment enablement onto your insurance platform some of the transactions are securing one line of business from your asset management and tight coupling it with the other line of business which could either be investment banking it could be retail or it could be commercial banking so i think that is where the cyber security aspect comes in machine learning and ai has been there its adoptability its acceptability in terms of the payments has been pretty high has been very high and what we are now trying to draw a plot is is the next generation view of ai there are certain um, countries that have adopted crypto as their uh, baseline currency it's a very common means of exchanging or uh, commoditizing the way you would interact into a retail world now if you have to look at it as a next generation it cannot just stop at blockchain and that is where the decentralized finance which is your embedded wealth the more context you draw the more adaptive context that the transactions are being looked at the interaction of data within the ecosystem is getting very high the analytics that runs behind the ecosystem is also very high the decision making that you would do based on the data that you would store based on the data that you would consume based on the data that you would see is again very high i think that is where there is a high synergy of machine learning ai and blockchain and that is where a lot of transactions are taking place from a fintech perspective our association with just our association with some other similar um, fintechs is 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 the exchange of data that happens on the ecosystem and that is where we see there is a lot of synergy that is being drawn and arvr uh, from uh, no surprise perspective uh, there is there is there is a high amount of uh, synergy touch points or propensity that gets drawn in biometric authentication facial recognition which is again a dialect of what you would look at from biometric side of it and then resulting is the execution piece which is the biometric payment cards uh, which would then take you to a next level of what upi would design i think that's the summary uh, that we wanted to draw i'll just take a pause and i'll check if arun is back and i'll let him continue with the presentation that he was running arun you online yeah sorry Anand, Hi, sir. Arun. sorry sorry network. back to you Can we go to that uh, feature slide? Yeah. Okay, sure. I think we covered this. Moving on. So, basis all these functionalities that are in pipeline to be launched in this uh, next two, two, three years, we see a uh, few trends emerging. One of them uh, is UPI getting more power, becoming more powerful, UPI becoming the center of this embedded finance ecosystem moving on um, and you becoming a playing a role of an enabler of other payment methods uh, for instance upa on cards cards becoming interoperable through upi prepaid instruments becoming interoperable through upi these are some of the phenomena that are going to pick up in the coming years where there is a lot of innovation that are going to happen and interestingly if you see upi as a protocol it's very open and it and it opens up a lot of new use cases. If you see in the last uh, last one year, the one to two years, there has been a lot of new features launched in UPI. Uh, in fact, it is close to 12 new features launched in the last one to two year period. So that's the kind of let's, agility that protocol itself is have, having. And it is innovating for new, new use cases and making you more uh, stickier towards UPI. I think that's what is going to make UPI more powerful in the coming years. And you see all these functionalities. In fact, at the core of digital innovation is going to be UPI. Every new features, every new functionality that is going to be conceived 
it's going to be conceived based on upi i think that's my humble thought in fact uh, so right now upi is around 63% contributing to 63% of the total digital transactions in india and as per an estimation it's going to go up to 73 and uh, and it has and one of the restricting function features uh, why it should only stop at 73 is because the number of the kind of limits that you're going to have on upi uh, currently a uh, transaction limit is 1 lakh rupees a uh, upi auto pay limit is uh, 15000 rupees things like that once it goes uh, once it evolves once there is better security and frms financial risk management systems comes into picture these limits are going to get relaxed and more 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 and more large ticket transactions are going to be through upi because of the experience upi gives compared to the other payment methods moving on and second is merchant payments is going to drive this next level of growth currently p2p is fairly kind of the growth in p2p have kind of let's say plateaued i wouldn't say uh, not as much as it was because the initial push for upi came from p2p transaction person to person transactions where uh, two friends can transact money between each other and settle money between them but merchant payments slowly picked up still cards and the other uh, net banking contributed to a large chunk of cards uh, merchant payments slowly upi picked up and still upi is only used for a, a low ticket low bar, low ticket transactions and uh, that phenomenon is going to change with credit cards coming to upi with ppi cards being accepted uh, interoperable through upi these are the developments that's going to drive that kind of uh, growth in merchant acceptance with rest, and similarly zero mdr is one functionality that is even going to like make almost all small merchants accept upi payments through a, a with limited or with a limited investments with respect to qr and not have a pos machine and cash on delivery is one functional one uh, key concern points for almost all digital commerce merchants where handling ca cash handling charges are, are significantly high for all these merchants so it will be interesting to see how these merchants adopt uh, how uh, convert their consumers from cash on delivery model to a digital model there are already constructs in place uh, through upi where you can have a dynamic qr flow when when a when a parcel is delivered it can have a qr and you can scan the qr and pay uh, dynamically it gets reconciled at the merchant end itself or there can be options of one time mandates uh, which we use for applying to ipos whenever you get an ip allotted then your money gets debited otherwise your money is returned similar kind of functionality can can it be used for cash on delivery because majorly people use cash on delivery because of lack of trust and they don't want to get their money locked how can new use cases evolve through upi to solve for cash on delivery because it still is a big pain point for all e-com merchants in india moving on with with this kind of vast data available um how can we what can be how can this customer experience be uh, improved is one key uh, one key area of concern for our rbi as well so trust initially we saw upis growth was majorly attributed to trust that who you are paying to and that gave the confidence for users to like make more payments similarly a dispute resolution where customers are transacting money and almost all of us would have experienced this thing when you are making a payment to a merchant sometimes they claim that they didn't receive the money but your money got lost and there is that confusion around that so a real time detection or real time visibility into where your payment is and uh, that is going to be an important functionality um, everybody is looking forward to and in fintechs are innovating how you can have better transparency and give better transparency and visibility to all your customers fraud detection with billions of people doing transaction how can you like reduce fraud there has been a lot of initiative taken taken by the regulator on the and npc as well to mitigate the fraud but how can you have a real time data based real time uh, fraud detection and uh, stopping a transaction in real time that's going to be an interesting uh, trend evolving in the next few years and with this data can there be an alternative mechanism for credit risk assessment a checkout financing is one other key trend that is evolving uh, how can payment uh, fintechs with a lot of payments data provide checkout financing without uh, accessing a lot of uh, bureau data with the bureau and uh, 
with their internal payments data. Uh, there is an aggregate account aggregator phenomenon that came up for all these kind of uh, aggregating all accounts from various uh, providers and giving a one single view of uh, your customer's profile. Similarly, can we leverage our data and have a better credit risk assessment for merchants and customers? That's going to be another uh, emerging trend coming up in the next few years. Moving on. When we are talking about building systems and providing payments for billions of people, few things become um, to your engineering uh, capability or your infrastructure, the systems become a core area of concern, especially when it comes to payments. Payments is a 24 seven business and it should be always available. Otherwise you will lose customers trust. Okay, my bank is always down, so I may not use UPA transaction. So things like that. So how can you have highly available systems, 100% available systems and innovating around that, having a self healing systems. If one system goes down, can other system come up and having top level redundancy, meaning can I have run my systems in two places, even one place goes down, can other system automatically take over and process a transaction. So reliability is, will be a key uh, area of concern for all these fintechs and banks and scale. When we are talking about billions of people transacting seamlessly scalable systems. When it comes to uh, systems, your traditionally your app servers and database servers can get bottlenecked. How you can scale your systems without needing to bottleneck on one or two systems, automatically seamlessly scalable systems, having two factor authentication, fraud monitoring uh, as part of security, having on top of all these things, when in NPCI or other uh, regulators when they're introducing new compliance new functionalities how good as a fintech we are able to like pivot and modify our business model or pivot and uh, do a new feature change an existing functionality for compliance reasons how fast we are able to do that that is going to be a defining feature for all uh, fintechs so, and all these things to be, to be done at affordability let's say payments is a low uh, low margin business and how can you have reliable systems, scalable systems, secure systems, and that, that should be able to like do faster, pivot faster and move agile. So if you're able to do all these things at low cost, that's where engineering innovation comes into picture. How you can extract value out of, out of your systems with respect to performance. Can I do, uh, can I go deeper and how, how many transactions one single core of a processor can process? How to optimize your transaction, how to, leverage your systems and performance for scale that's going to be an interesting engineering innovation uh, every fintech should be focusing on in the coming days yeah over to you Anand. yeah yeah so uh, i believe uh, i covered the slide uh, it was more of a, a true string precursor to the six factor uh, but logical conclusion in terms of how you would look at everywhere uh, uh, every time and everything um, that was the context that was the model with that i'll give it to uh, shrikant i'm conscious of the time i can talk everybody to death which i want to avoid so i'll give it back to shrikant shrikant all yours yeah sure uh thanks arun and anand uh i mean they were very uh interesting data points that uh, both of you had shared uh, i just had two questions uh one for arun basically uh the starting one so I don't, uh, you know, just want to understand what is JustPay's role in the entire payments 2.0 scenario, right? You could throw some light on it. Sure. So uh, JustPay has been a, so we have been in the merchant business powering, uh, having an orchestration layer for merchants and uh, solving for experience for customers through some of our products. Uh, so what we have evolved into is uh, we, we have a lot of ecosystem investments happening right from the inception of UPI, JustPay has been involved uh, in uh, with NPCI and we, JustPay is one company that built the BMAP within three weeks. When demonetization happened, there was a need for launch of UPI app, we built uh, UPI. And since then, our journey has been uh, in uh, towards uh, building UPI platforms for all banking partners and uh, large TPAPs, third-party application providers like Google Pay or Amazon Pay. Currently, JustPay processes close to 25 million uh, transactions a day. 
25 million transactions a day. So what we do apart from this is a lot of ecosystem investments, work with a lot of these regulators with respect to defining protocols, building and co-creating with the ecosystem. In that regard, whatever we talked about, we give it as a holistic UPI in a boss solution. We build all this solution and give it as a holistic solution to a lot of banking partners and uh, UPI partners like uh, Amazon and Google. That's what we have been doing. But some of these things a little bit are since we are working with some regulators, some of these things are confidential, but we have been working with them for innovating towards simplifying payments, reducing friction in payments, alternative authentication in payments. That's what JustPay has been doing. So. Quite, quite an interesting uh, journey, I guess, in the coming years for you. Uh, Anand, uh, from a tech perspective, right? Uh, see, we know that uh, a lot of these technologies are uh, proliferating, uh, primarily under the digital umbrella. So what, according to you, are the top three dimensions, say, a financial institution should uh, start focusing on from a tech perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, the, the way the technology canvas is evolving, while there is a high degree of adoptability of emerging tech, there is also an aspect that many times comes into your transformation journey slightly later it's almost like the the view of test automation back in the day in, in waterfall you looked at it as one of the aspects very later point but in agile it's part of how you develop and design similar to that while cloud adoption is at its pace cloud wastage aspect of cloud adoption cloud compute is, is a very critical aspect there is a lot of money being burned uh, in terms of how you would manage that how do you strategize that strategy is a slightly overcooked work uh, from cloud wastage, but you still need to uh, put a strong thinking cap on. And it's almost similar to how you would have a top-down versus bottom-up DevOps approach. So cloud wastage is definitely one. The second is, is a dialect of data ops, which is, which is, uh, which is within the uh, DevOps part of it. With so much of data being consumed across and within the ecosystem, there is a lot of decision-making that sits. And there is a lot of uh, data ownership, data distribution, data cataloging that needs to happen. So data ops is one of the key areas that at least as a services company that uh, we are seeing. Um, and the third aspect is uh, is experience, is how do you build that customer experience? So it has been there, but it continues to be one of the leading factor to build that canvas, is how do you still make it seamless? How do you still make it adaptive? How do you still draw new context to the data? How do you decide something based on a consumer spend pattern and then how do you present it back to the consumer so that he or she understands and learns from it and consumes furthermore so i think customer experience to a next level cloud wastage and data ops are the three aspects that uh, i i would believe the financial services firm uh, uh, would focus on okay sure uh, that was quite informative uh, so thank you once again arun and Anand. And uh, for all the attendees, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Our next webinar is on uh, winning with digital-led product transformation, which is slated for the 8th of September. So look forward to your presence also in this thing. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.